Welcome to Living the Off-Grid Dream, where we talk about how to get land, start a homestead, a retreat, regenerative farm, or community, and live a life of health and freedom, even if you're starting with nothing like we did. We cover all this and how to be financially free while doing it, and the failures and lessons we have learned along the way. I hope you enjoy and subscribe. Well, yeah, thank you for thank you for being here. Thank you for chatting with us. We're super excited. Um, I was maybe going to give a little bit of a background for any listeners that may not have heard of you, although I'm sure 99% of them already have. Okay. So, um, yeah, so basically, uh, uh, this is Joel Salatin. Uh, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here. Uh, so, Joel, you, how many acres is your farm and whereabouts are you? So we're in Virginia, in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, which is on the western edge of the state. And our... Um, uh, we we own we own 950 acres um and we then we lease about another 1400 acres uh, oh wow so, so we're we're actually managing a little over 2000 acres and a lot of that's wooded i mean here of, of what we own here 700 is forest so we have a lot of trees wow beautiful i love that yeah and so we, so you- and we have we have a lot of elevation change too uh the Shenandoah, so the house here is at eighteen hundred feet, and um, and the top of the farthest corner of the property is twenty eight hundred feet. So we have a thousand feet of elevation uh, gradation difference on the on the property. So that's oh, an, wow. an that, that's an asset and a liability. The asset is that we have over the years built about twenty ponds, permaculture style, and we have twelve miles of gravity fed um, water line. That that gives us 70, 70 pound pressure water over the whole place uh, from these high ponds. Wow, wow, that's awesome. This is this is super cool. I love that because we're doing something very similar on our property because we don't actually have enough water. Our well is only eight gallons a minute. Um, so to have cattle and do any kind of larger, like any kind of scalable uh, agriculture, we just need more water. So right now we're working on building out a network of 35 ponds to be able uh-huh. to do pretty much exactly what you guys are doing. Um, so that's super cool. I've, when I first heard of you, I, I watched your guys' documentary, um, which I it, I don't, I forget what it's called. Is it is it just called your farm name, Polyface Farms? Yeah, I think it's just Polyfaces. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so if anybody w- wants to watch that and hasn't already, it's really, really awesome. Um, but that kind of connect the dots for me there because I mean it's been a while since I've watched it, but uh, I didn't real. I knew you were building ponds in that documentary, but I didn't know that it was gravity feeding water lines um, to th- throughout your pasture. I suppose. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. That's right. So we have so we we have high water, what we call high water, that feeds the livestock, and then we've built. Uh, uh, Low, low ponds down where it's cheaper and easier to collect more water and uh and near near where our our infrastructure is where we have power and uh that then we use for irrigation so we we have kind of um we, we that 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 high pressure water is too precious to use for irrigation so we we use that for the livestock and then use the low ponds for irrigation oh, okay cool Cool. That's awesome. So a little bit of a two two prong approach. One yeah. is actually pressurized with pumps for irrigation, and then the other form is uh, for basically just for livestock to drink. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Cool. And do you? Uh, this is just a a, que- a question I had. Do you um, do you irrigate all of your pasture land? <laughs> no, I wish we could. We we're not there yet, as you know. The big cost of irrigation is uh is getting enough water inventory a la you know pa yeomans and so so we finally got enough water inventory so we're running four 12 pod k line uh systems that allow us to irrigate uh we we can get six inches of water on um on on 60 acres or so 60 70 acres and uh it's not all of our we have 250 acres open here and so that doesn't get all of it but uh, but, you know, it, it, get, it gets a lot and we just keep building every every time we get a little bit of cash, we build another pond. Uh, so our idea of what we've been doing is pretty much building our irrigation ponds next to the fields we want to irrigate. So rather than having one humongous lake with a great big six inch, you know, main line going somewhere, instead, we have this network of ponds 
all positioned right next to the field where we want the water and then and then we can and then we can gravity flow from big ponds to those near ponds where we have electricity so we can then pump it back out under pressure oh, okay okay that makes sense so for the for the um acreage that you have that is unirrigated right now do you still use that um for for your cattle and for your livestock in certain oh, yeah. times of the year when the grass is good Oh yeah, absolutely. We're we're in a we're in a 31 inch rainfall uh, uh area. So we get, you know, we, we get fairly dependable rain, although normally uh four years out of five, we'll have either a drought in the spring or in the fall. We'll, you know, we'll it, there'll be a there'll be a drought. Uh, 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 let's say put it an, enough enough to stress the grass growth and um yeah. to where the grass stops growing. And so now, now that being said. Uh, we've also in in uh, 60 years taken our organic matter from one percent to 8.2. So every every percentage of organic matter increase holds 20,000 gallons of water per acre. So we've we've jumped it up seven percent. So seven times 20 is 140,000 gallons of water we can now hold and 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 uh, whatever store per acre in the soil that we couldn't you know 60 years ago. So that's a that that's a big addition as well. Wow. Yeah, that's absolutely massive. So on the farm right now, um, you're, it's a livestock farm. Uh, and you guys, if to the best of my knowledge, you have broilers, uh, chickens, laying hens, turkeys, pigs, and cattle. Is that right? Yeah, we have ducks and lamb and rabbit as well. Oh, wow. Okay. So pretty much everything. <laughs> well, ex except for the exotics, you know, like llamas and alpacas and things like that. But, uh, I haven't figured out how to make any money with them and I haven't figured out how to make any money with a horse either. So <laughs> yeah, you know, I want a horse and everyone keeps telling me that's going to cost a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, but, when they, uh, they, they, they kid me and say, well, you know, um, tractors don't have babies, horses replace themselves. And I say, well, but, a, but, a um, a tractor stops eating when you park it too. <laughs> <laughs> that's great so besides from the animal agriculture have you found uh that it's worthwhile to sell any byproducts from the farm such as compost or anything of that sort oh i would never sell compost that's way that's that's way too precious to sell i, I mean, had a I, feeling you were going to say that <laughs> now, if, if i were if you gotta we're we're very rural here we're on a dirt road uh, we're not near a metropolitan area at all. And so we have tried to do everything from, you know, uh, food waste recycling to whey, whey fed to pigs to, you know, any number of gleaning type things. And, um, and, and we've just never been able to make it work because we're, we're too remote. Uh, in order, in order to do that, you pretty much have to be, you know, either in the city or right on the edge of a, of a pretty large city in order to, in order to accumulate enough stuff, you know, aggregate and uh, aggregate enough stuff uh, fast enough, quick enough to be able to do that kind of thing. Uh, man, I, I would love to do that. I mean, we're, we're working on even trying to bring back all our guts from the slaughterhouse uh, to compost. Um, but, you know, these are all, you know, when you're, when you're running miles and paying diesel fuel, um, you know, the, the economics just don't always work for that. So, um, so we're, we're working on it, but it's, um, it's not, it's not easy to do some of that. What, what we all know in our hearts needs to be done, but what we need is people, is people on the edges of cities to, to come aboard and, 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 uh, they can't do some of the things we do either. You know, they might not have a mountain in their backyard that they can gravity feed water from. Okay. So we can do things that they can't do. Um, but they, they need to step up and do things that we can't do. Yeah. I think that's a really good point because, you know, one of our specialties, one of the things that we help clients do mostly is get into land ownership um, or get on land, whatever that might mean, whether it's leasing or whether it's buying land or whatever it might be. Um, and it's, it's, I think that's a huge part of choosing the property that you want is knowing what you'd want to do, because if somebody wanted to, if they had this big idea that they were going to, uh, you know, do a specific type of farming 
or uh, get into agriculture in another way, such as creating compost and selling compost, some areas and some lots of land will not be right for what they're trying to do. So they need to know what they want to do prior to making a, a decision on where they're going to go with it. Yeah, that that's true. And in general, if I'm if 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 I want to do, let's just talk about direct marketing or branded marketing. Uh, if you're going to do that, I would much rather have a very small acreage next to an urban center than a than a large acreage far away. If you're if you're 200 miles from a Coke machine, and and I, I I'm not a Coke drinker. I'm just using it as a as a illustration. If you're 200 miles from a Coke machine, it's pretty hard to direct market, and so. Um, so you, you, if you're going to direct market, you need to be near enough to a, a consumer base to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So if for somebody who is starting out, out of all of the different types of livestock that you're working with, what would you recommend somebody to start with that might be, you know, have the fastest timeline to get going, um, be like cheapest for infrastructure to get going uh, and kind of get them going quick enough to cover their own cost of operating. What would you recommend for somebody to get yeah, started? Uh, yeah. Hands, hands down. It's the broiler chicken, the meat chicken, as opposed to the laying chicken. Now I love layers because it's cash flow. You know, it's like a dairy cow. They, you know, old, old El Elvani's uh, butter and egg money, you know, that wasn't what floated the farm, but that's what kept them out of the, that, that cash, cash flow is as important as actual uh, total income. And, and most businesses actually fail, not because they don't have a good service or a good product. They fail because they, the, of cash flow. They, the, the bills are coming in faster than the, the money's coming in the front end, or there's, you know, there's, there's a glitch in, in that somewhere. So the broiler chicken is my go-to. Uh, first of all, everybody eats chicken. I mean, well, more the per capita consumption of chicken is more than anything else. Um, and and it's, it's an eight-week turnaround. You get the chick eight weeks and you're out. You know, it's as fast as a radish. And and so, you know, you don't have a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, religious taboos, different things. And it's it's an every it's an every day. It's a very consumable. Everybody eats chicken. They eat a lot of chicken. And um, and so it's it's a it's a repeat. You know, you, you want you want to have something consumable. Uh, nobody nobody makes money on a first sale. It costs too much to get a customer to make any money on a first sale. You make your money on your second, third, and fourth sales, whether that's a product or a service or anything else. E even an accountant doesn't make money the first time a client comes to do his taxes. He makes money when they come back a second time because he's already got a template and you know knows the person, that sort of thing. There's so much inertia to, to the startup. So, so, um, so what you're looking for is something that's repetitive. A broiler chicken, you know, is, is very repetitive and it's very easy to process in your backyard. It's child friendly. It, it, it doesn't take heavy, heavy gates and structures. You don't even need a tractor. You don't need anything special. All the infrastructure, if you use portable infrastructure is lightweight and you don't have to own the land that you're on. You can, I mean, the, the, it's been wonderful to watch. Uh, young people jump onto this uh, uh, pastured chicken and do it on land they don't own that they don't even pay any rent on because the farmer is happy to get the nitrogen and the, and the, and the fertility from the chickens. And so you can get on land for free. And that wow. makes a pretty nice, pretty nice deal. Wow, that's actually really cool. I never thought about that. We do. I do think that that leasing land is like really underutilized because I think a lot of people, their their only thought in their head, they're not really thinking outside the box. They're just thinking, I need to buy land. And I think some of that comes from even an egotistic perspective with some folks where they just want to buy land and that's the only option they want to consider. However, if you can lease land uh, or like you're saying, get land for free to start an operation like this, uh, start bringing in some money, you know, one day you save up enough money to go buy your own property next door. Yeah. Well, right now we're leasing, we're releasing probably 50, 50 million dollars worth of property for about fifty thousand dollars a year. So yeah, th th I mean, I mean, it's like <laughs> it's like a tenth of a percent. Uh <laughs> because because see the 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 cost of land when you buy land, that land is not being sold for its productive value. It's it's being sold for its viewscape, for its, as you said, for you know, everybody wants a piece of land. I mean, you know, that's in our that's in our 
our, our DNA, you know, to want a piece of land. Um, and so it's being sold for emotional and other reasons besides, you know, productivity. But when, but, but the rent renting, all of that is based on actual productive capacity, actual. Yeah. So as a result, a lease is actually an honest reflection of land to production ratio as, um, as opposed to uh, ownership. Uh, my quick soundbite on that is when mom and dad bought this farm, the original 550 acres in 1961, it was $90 an acre, $90 an acre. And feeder cattle were bringing $180 and you could raise half of a feeder calf on an acre. So that calf, that annual production from that acre on a feeder calf was $90. So the land was $90 in value. The calf was $90 in value. That's a one-to-one. -one, uh, in other words, and, and that's a one season. That's not five years, 10 years. That, that's one season, all right? Mm -hmm. Today, the, today the land is, is uh, $7,000 an acre, and that calf is now $700 a, a calf. Half of that's $350. So $7,000 to $350 is a 20 to 1 ratio. So in my lifetime, we've gone from 1 to 1 land to production value to 20 to 1. And that's why what grandpa did won't work anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That makes total sense. And it's kind of sad almost um, to, you know, pushing out the little guys and bringing in things like BlackRock that are just buying up all the farmland. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that's, that's true. Although, um, although a, a lot of it is available and I'm glad it's coming available. It's coming available right at the time when we have a homestead tsunami and a lot of people, you know, looking for an option out of the urban sector as as a trust in in um, in basic you know uh, institutions throughout the country is falling, and uh, people are looking for self reliance and their own garden and their own chickens and their own applesauce and their own uh, you know pear tree, and uh, and so I'm you know I, I think it's it's a it's a natural natural you know kind of provision that this that farmers are aging out they're averaging sixty years old so a lot of this land is transferring. And um, and it's right at a at an opportune time for this new wave of self reliance to actually uh, be able to uh, jump on it. So I'm hoping that thousands and hundreds of thousands of of uh, bright eyed, uh, bushy tailed, entrepreneurial, compost growing, uh, self starting uh, farmers are going to jump on all this available ag agrarian equity and take us to a new a new uh, plateau in the next millennium. Beautiful. Yeah, me as well. That's very, very well put. And you are definitely leading the charge with helping people do that. So I appreciate everything that you're doing and all the inspiration that you are. Thank you. Glad to. So, so glad with, to... Uh, I was curious uh, for with your chickens, if that's, you know, that's the first thing that you would start with, with broiler chickens. Um, what, uh, I was, I'm always curious about feed and, and how much like, are you able to create, like, I know you have the system where they were, are, are those the chickens following your cattle and they're, you know, eating the maggots and stuff out of the, uh, out of the cow pies and whatnot. Um, and how much additional grain do you have to bring in to feed them? Because we have a lot of clients that come in and they're trying to be like fully self-sufficient. And I'm kind of like, I don't, it's not really possible to be fully self-sufficient. Like even the Amish aren't fully self-sufficient. There's always trading going on um and uh and, and yeah one thing that like we had huge grain shortages up here so i was just curious if there's any way to kind of subsidize some of the chicken feed from your own farm well the answer to that of course is yes but the practical answer is there's a reason why people feed grain so what what follow so what we follow the cows with is the is the layers um, okay so, so the, you know, they're a lot more agile. They're they're uh, smarter. Uh, you know, they're just hardier. Whereas the broiler chickens, you know, they grow. They're they're race car, NASCAR, high high octane, double breasted birds, and uh, so they they take a pretty high octane. Um, now you can go to a, a very slow growing heritage bird uh, that grows, you know, half as fast and is more. You know, will 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 you know uh, um, you know root hog or die a little better. You know they'll 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 get out there and get after it a little better. But uh, the problem then is marketability. 
you know, it, when you're when you're marketing and you're branding something, um, especially if it's something that's kind of in the marketplace and you're just trying to become uh, uh, create uh, brand recognition and difference. Uh, you can only be so weird. My mentor, Alan Nation, uh, used to say uh, in marketing, you can be a Buddhist or you can be a nudist, but a nudist Buddhist. I mean, they just won't trust you. And, <laughs> and, and so so when you tell me when you tell people, you know, uh, not only do you not want to get your chicken at Walmart or, you know, the, the supermarket, you want to get it from me and you don't want that double breasted bird. You want all dark meat. Who wants that old white meat? Who wants that big breast? You want a razor breast and and and, and cook it fast. Now, nah, you don't want to fry that chicken. You want to cook it in a crock pot where you got to cook it for, uh, you know, three hours, at, you know, and 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 you've just become too weird. And so so um, uh, I, I make I make no apologies for the fact I mean, some people, of course, they they excoriate us for, you know, using an industrial genetic chicken, same you know, genetics that Tyson uses. But um, we we don't apologize for trying to offer a credible alternative to the entire factory farming system. And and once we once we uh, eliminate the factory farming system, then there's plenty of room for additional, you know, niches of niches of niches of niches. And so. um so yes, you can, you can, you know, you can do, we've played with earthworms. You can do soldier fly larva. Uh, you know, you can do things, but um, it, 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 if you go to any scale at all, uh, it becomes a tail that wags the dog because all that stuff is squishy, parable, perishable. You're trying to feed guts. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it just becomes really, uh, really difficult. There, there's a reason why, you know, there's a reason why the industry uses grain. If, if if there was something that was cheaper and easier, they'd probably use it. And and listen, the day the day you can't get grain uh, is gonna be is gonna be a, a day that we're you know we're back in the cave. Um, uh, you know, I, I've had in the last two years, I've had about four or five billionaires call me. These are billionaires, not millionaires, and um, and they they and, and they're looking for. Um, a safe place, a haven. I call, I, they don't use this term, but I, I call it an agrarian bunker. They're looking for an agrarian bunker. They think the wheels are going to fall off and uh, I got to get to a safe place. And one of them asked me once, he says, what do you, what's your definition of the wheels falling off? What does that mean? The wheels falling off. So I said, well, I don't know. Give me a week to think about it. So I put it to my team. I said, you know, what do you guys think wheels falling off? And um, you know, there are numerous things that you could come up with. We came up with three three things. One is you can't get uh, fuel. Two, you can't get electricity. And three, you can't get grain. If you can't get fuel, electricity, or grain, you are in a world of hurt. And so if it, it, everybody thinking about self-reliance, if you start if you start thinking about those three things and attack those as a strategy um, to, to kind of immunize yourself, if you will, uh, against those three things, the more you can immunize yourself, uh, you know, the, the, the better you'll be able to handle shocks. And so, yes, we use grain, but we buy it from local uh, GMO free farmers. So we know where it is. We know who they are. They know us. We pay them more for it. It's local. It's not coming from Ukraine. It's not coming from Russia. It's not coming from Uzbekistan, you know, and so it, it's local right here. And we, we are very happy of the fact that we have, we have, um, whatever we have, incentivized we have financed um you know several hundred acres here in the area that are gmo free that would not be gmo free if we weren't here and so we we're, we're thankful for that yeah that's really epic i that's uh I, I totally i couldn't agree more with all of that stuff i think that basically comes down to just just being a good member of community and supporting you know good farmers and other people that you know are, are just a part of your ecosystem and we we do the same thing you know we've had people that have come up and lived in our land and they're they've been scared of uh you know food they want food security they've been scared that you know the whole food network is just going to collapse underneath them so right away they're like, we need a garden we need a garden and you know we we ended up spending thirty thousand dollars 
getting a small garden going. Um, and the, you know, the garden was great and everything else, but I'm, I'm just like, man, that thing was like a massive amount of work for a very little amount of like calorie output. Um, and for the same, for like a cheaper price of what we were paying someone to manage the garden and weed it and get it set up every year and all of that kind of stuff. And not to mention, get it going. We could have just formed a really good relationship with a local farm that was, you know, non-GMO, fully organic, beyond organic, whatever, whatever it might be, whatever it might be that we're looking for. Uh, and just, you know, we we have those relationships now and we're some of their top clients. So if anything was ever to happen, who do you, who do you think that they're going to trust first, the people that they have good relationships with? Sure. Sure. Yeah, I, I absolutely I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I believe that the next uh, the next 401k plan. The next 401k plan is living proximate in relationship with people who know how to grow things, fix things, and build things. Yeah, absolutely. That's the, that, that's the next 401k. I love that. So we talked about broiler chickens. Out of everything that you're doing now, what are the next two? Like, let's say you started with broiler chickens, you mastered that for a couple of years, and it was going well. Then what are the next two things that you would move into and reinvest into? Yeah, probably the next two things would be uh, laying chickens for eggs, and um, and and then the next one is either, and I don't have a, a strong preference here. A lot of it is it has to do with regulations. It would either be pork or or milk, uh, a, a milk cow or pigs, and of course, you know, milk cows and pigs go real well together. Uh, you know, uh, pigs love soured milk and whey and stuff left over from cheese making. Um, so some of this is just how tied down you want to be. As soon as you go to milking something, uh, now suddenly you're tied down. At least with all the other livestock, you can you can go away a day. You can you can you know uh, you, you can go to a party one evening and you know not have to do anything. You have a little bit of flexibility. Uh, I mean, even if you're if even if you're controlled grazing, you know you can uh, you can give the cows a three day paddock instead. of of a one if you want to if you if you have a couple pigs you can give them enough food for three days and not just one day um so there there are things that you can do but as soon as you start milking you're really really tied down and so uh i tell people it's fine to milk but as along with your it, it, as soon as you make that decision in the next minute you need to be making a list of people who will be your stand-ins your your um your substitutes otherwise you're going to get really tired of that cow or that goat or that sheep uh that you're milking because you can't get away you, you can't go to a, ne a niece's birthday party you can't go down you know it makes it even hard to, to to go to church or to go to a you know a philanthropic club or the theater a play one night maybe you want to go to you know, anyway you, you get what i'm saying and, and so so dairying while dairying if you can get sell it for retail or 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 give it away and take donations or herd share or you know skirt skirt the laws the thing about dairy is there's so many regulations about it but um you know if if you can if you can figure out a way i mean here a lot of milk is being sold for pet food there's uh there's herd shares um uh you you know uh, pers uh private membership associations pmas are are big workarounds i mean there's all sorts of of mechanisms uh, to work around regulations, but, um, but the, the, the pig or the dairy, either one of those would be my next go a after the eggs, the eggs, again, the eggs, it's, it, it's, it's a very child-friendly thing. The chickens are all very child-friendly. They're, you know, they, they, they're not going to hurt your child. Uh, it doesn't take big, expensive, difficult infrastructure, and, uh, it's very, very highly portable. Um, and, and as soon as you go to something, uh, big enough to milk, or a pig. Now you're getting. Now you're dealing with a little bit of you know stronger infrastructure, a little more safety issues with children. You know, a little, little and, and and visitors and visitors. And so you know you kind of have to watch that up. Yeah, yeah, that's not, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, I think in our emails back and forth, you mentioned um, an investment ratio, and I believe that would have been probably with broiler chickens. Uh, do you know the investment ratio on like for every dollar you put in, what do you what do you receive out uh, when working with with broilers? Oh, uh, boy, uh, you're catching me off guard here. Uh, I, I could figure it out for you. 
Uh, but in general, let, let, let me do it this way. Um, you can start, the, the beauty of this pastured poultry thing is that you can start with one module. Okay, so so um, our my, my three M's for this are uh, mobile, modular, and management intensive, all right? So because it's mobile, you don't have to own the land, all right? Well, that knocks a big part of your investment off. Because it's modular, you can start with one and you scale with duplication, not centralization. So you so um, you have one module. So one of our modules costs about four hundred dollars, and in one season you can run uh, you can run four batches through there. At least in our in our area, our frost dates are May fifteen and September fifteen. So uh, we can run four batches through one shelter in a season, and um, and you know you can use for a brooder. You can use cardboard boxes if you're that small. And just put them in your garage or your living room or or the bathroom or the bathtub or whatever, <laughs> and and uh, you know and and brew these little chicks. So if we've got if we've got um, um, seven seventy sale birds times four batches, that's two hundred and eighty. The whole the the shelter and everything else. Uh, let, let's just say we've got uh, six hundred dollars in the whole setup, two hundred eighty birds, and we're going to sell them for twenty bucks. That's uh, five thousand six hundred dollars. The um, so uh, if you if you add on if you add on the processing equipment, let's just say the processing, you know, a, a picker and a scalder and maybe a stainless steel table or something. Let's say that that's three thousand dollars with a with a um, a ten year depreciation, which uh, that's three hundred dollars per year. So we've got six hundred uh, plus three hundred. That's nine hundred dollars to turn fifty six hundred dollars in the very first season. Whatever wow. that ratio okay. is, that's what. That's what. That's a. That's like a, a. A six. That's like a, a six. A six to one ratio. Wow. That's so. So you you can actually. So yeah, you can do pretty well. And like once you're up and going, I think that's really cool that you can. Like it, it seems pretty scalable. So like you could start with. What was the number you could start with? Was it nine nine hundred bucks, and you would make five grand roughly? Yeah, fifty six hundred. Now that's gross. That's gross. That's not net. Yeah, that's gross. That's not net. But yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. Just just think, just think what it would be. Just think what a person that builds up a, a six seven hundred thousand dollar Tyson chicken house. Uh, think about think about their their ratio. I mean, their ratio is is probably not even one to one. It's, it's Oh yeah, one. it costs them like a million dollars to build a barn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean it, yeah, and, and in a year in a year they might, you know, they might take in um yeah, uh you know, it, it's probably it's probably, you know, a, a tenth to one or something, you know, it's it's crazy. So what's the uh, and what's the turnaround on that? So it was that for was that calculations for a full year? Yeah, that, that was for a full, a, a whole six month, six month season. Six so month we, season. Okay, so cool. We do six, six month on, six month off. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that seems really, really cool and really easy to reinvest with the, you know, replicating it, like you mentioned yes. earlier. That's cool. Yeah. That, that seems really awesome. So how much, I, I guess for somebody to make a living off of it, um, how many, how many acres do you think they would need? And what, what do you think like? Let's say they were going to go into this and they were just they wanted to make sure that they had enough money to build enough infrastructure to make a livable wage um, for a couple of people. Maybe it's 100 grand a year or 80 grand a year or I mean, I'm talking Canadian dollars. So I guess let's say like, I don't know, even 60 grand US would be a pretty cool start for somebody to get out and start farming and quit their day job. Um, yeah. What do you think is the minimum amount of land and what would you recommend they go into it with savings? Yeah, well, let, let, let's um, let's let's do this. Let's do this backwards. Let's figure it backwards. So if you if you figure a thirty percent margin, a thirty percent margin, uh, in, enterprise margin, and you want sixty thousand dollars to your overheads, um, that means that you need a hundred and eighty thousand dollars gross to make a sixty thousand dollar enterprise margin. Am I right on that? Yeah, one hundred eighty. A thirty percent of uh, thirty percent of one eighty is sixty thousand. So, so if if we start, we say we, we need we need to take in one hundred and eighty thousand, and we're going to sell these chickens for twenty dollars a piece. That means we're going to need to raise um, nine thousand chickens, 
okay? And if each of our shelters can raise 280 in a season, I'll get my little calculator out here. You need 32 I, shelters. Uh, yes, boy, you're quick. Okay, <laughs> yeah, 32 shelters, okay? So the 32 shelters times $400 a piece. About 13 grand. Yeah, yeah, thirteen thousand dollars, and you're going to need uh, to do that. You're you're going to want about um, five thousand dollars in processing equipment. You know, a nice picker, a nice scalder, a nice table. You know, some uh, some hose and fittings, and maybe a a shed or something. Um, so you've got five thousand in that. You're going to have some, uh, you know, some 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 sort of cold storage. Uh, uh, you know, several chest freezers or something. So, so let, let's let, let's just say that you're you're up there in your in your freezing um, capacity. You're up there in the in the four thousand. Uh, that's nine. Um, so so yeah, we're we're up there around around twenty one thousand, somewhere between twenty and twenty five thousand of of total upfront investment. You know, there's going to be a few other things. There's going to be I mean, you're going you're going to need some sort of a a little trailer cart or something. The you know haul stuff out to the chickens. You're going to need a few crates to haul the chickens in. You know, so there's, there's stuff around. I mean, I, I could, if you actually wanted a true business plan, I could, you know, I could spend some time on this, but, but I, I think it's fair enough to say that certainly for under 25,000, you could be up and running with your $180,000 business, you know, uh, in, in a literally, literally in a, you know, in a couple of weeks. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible. Um, I mean, obviously there'd also be the cost of like buying the chicks um, and then all, and then like feed and whatnot. Well, too. That, like, that, 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 that's all figured into it. That's what the other, other 120,000 goes to. Oh, okay. Right. So you're just counting that in cash flow. So yeah, like basically if you started with, you could start with $30,000 and you could make 180 grand a year revenue and about 60,000 in profit off of that. And like basically quit your day job and, yes. and start farming, which is pretty epic. Like that's, uh, there's not a lot of things that you can do to invest $30,000 and get 60,000 a year out of it. Um, I think, I think that's pretty cool. Those numbers work out way better than I would have thought or was led to believe. Yeah, well, um, again, rem rem remember the uh, the Achilles heel of this whole thing. It's fun to talk about this. That th this is what can be done, but remember, you got to sell those chickens, right? You you got to sell those chickens, a and you've got to sell them at retail. You can't sell them to Tyson. You can't sell them to Walmart. You you're going to have to sell those chickens direct. So somehow, so so um, if we if we think about that for a moment. Um, we're going to, we're going to do, we're going to do. So, so let's talk about the land first. So those 9,000 birds uh, are going to take, we run about 600 birds per acre. That's going to take 15 acres. So there, and there is not a cattle farm, wheat farm, uh, pig farm, orchard, vineyard. There's, there's not another, there's not a piece of land in the world that wouldn't benefit from running broilers stacking uh, excuse me, from stacking a broiler enterprise, you know, on that, on that piece of land and, and many farms, again, many farms, you know, you go to them and you say, tell you what, I'll fertilize 15 acres and you don't have to pay me for it. You know, all, all you're going to do is let me, you know, let me use it. All right. So now we got to sell those, those, so we got 9,000 birds we're going to sell. And if we figure the, um, the right in the U S the average per capita consumption on chicken is 72 pounds per year. So let's um, seventy-two pounds. Well, nine thousand divided by seventy-two is one hundred and twenty-five people. But that's actual meat. You're going to have bone and stuff in there. So, so let's just, for sake of discussion, say we need to have at least two hundred customers. Um. You know, if 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 these folks eat, you know, if a family, if if the um, 
if a family, let's just, well, let's look about it. Let's think about it this way. If a family eats two chickens a week, a household, okay, that's a hundred a year. All right. So 9,000 chickens divided by 100 per year is 90 households. So you need, so you need a hundred, you need a hundred families. You need, you need a hundred carnivorous families <laughs> to, to, to sell to. All right. And, and you know, when, when you start breaking it down, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So I love doing this kind of stuff because, well, a hundred families, you know, look, even, even if it took 150, all right, 150, my goodness, you start thinking about friends and, 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 and your, your, you know, your, your uh, people that, you know, people maybe at work, uh, people in the city, people at the fitness gym, uh, the chiropractor, the acupuncture, you know, all the, all the quack in the medical field, um, you know, and, and you start putting together, I mean, in, in my uh, pastured poultry book, I talk about making a hit list, make, make a hit list of, of 50 people and give each of them two chickens and you will get at least half of them as customers. That's pretty good return on a, on a sample. And so, you know, in, 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 in a, if you're savvy uh, in a year or two, you can get those customers and you're up and running, you know, they're, they're not going to come to you overnight. You know, marketing is, ne as you know, marketing is never e as easy as, as it sounds. Uh, you know, we, we'd love to think the, the, the biggest lie in the world was Kevin Costner's uh, film, you know, uh, uh, you build it, the field of dreams, you know, you build it and they will come. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, you, you, you build it and you have, <laughs> And you have to keep marketing and marketing and marketing and marketing and marketing. Uh, they, they don't they don't come. And, and so this is this is the same way. It can be the best chicken in the world, but you still have to build the business and, and do the marketing. Yeah, I, I mean, and I feel like I don't personally, that doesn't seem very difficult at all um, to me. Like I actually as soon as you said like 150 people and like making a hit list, I actually thought of uh, my spouse and I are talking about getting married and we're talking about guest lists and we have, you know, this big property. We want to have a dream wedding and we want to invite 500 people. And she's uh, like, there's no way we do. We don't know 500 people. And I'm like, I bet you that we do know 500 that we would want to invite. So we start yeah. making a list and I'm like, there's a hundred people on your side of the family. There's 150 yeah. people on my side of the family. Yeah, like yeah. It, it just, it goes so fast. Yeah. So I, and yeah. then, even in the in even with like social media, I mean, you could throw up some videos and get some followers and message each follower. Like you would have a hundred. I, I I'm very certain that people could have 150 clients in their first year if they put in that effort. Um, yeah. and, and they could probably do it at very low cost to to just a little bit of you know manual labor to get the word out there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's awesome. So do you guys do all of your own butchering on site? And is there is there uh, like regulations and stuff around that? And uh, I'm, I, you wrote a whole book on this, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of regulations. But now in that now you're in Canada. And Canada yeah. is a is a uh, is a Gestapo compared to America when it comes to because you've got the quota system. Uh, you got the quota, so you can't just go out and buy chicks. You've got to buy quota, which means that that you what what you're looking is for workarounds, and so there are there are numerous workarounds, and I I know people in Canada who have done workarounds. Um, if you if you get something like a free a, a red ranger or a kosher king rather than the Cornish cross, for example, that qualifies as a different as as an experimental breed. So there, there, are, there, there are numerous things that you can do as a workaround in Canada. In the U.S., we have this. We, we of course, don't have any quota system. And so anybody can buy as many chickens as they want and start right into the business. Uh, the regulations really come in on the processing. And so, uh, so yeah, we, we process almost all the birds here on the farm. Um, we do ship, ship nationally. And so for those that were shipping interstate, uh, we go to a little federal inspected processing facility and uh, and get those done down there so that they're USDA um, certified and they can be sold uh, across state lines. Um, okay, so if you're just selling within your state, like within your local uh, region, right. it's easier. Yeah, it, it it's def definitely easier. And and um, you know we and we have a, what's called a public law ninety four ninety two. 
PL 90-492. It's a federal exemption that allows you to raise 20,000 chickens as a producer grower, process them yourself and, and sell them. I can't butcher, I can't butcher your chickens. Uh, but, but as long as I raise them, I can process them without inspection. And, um, and all I have to be is sanitary and unadulterated, which is very subjective, but, uh, that's a both, that, that, that's both an asset and a li it's a liability. So if you have a, if you have a, a tyrannical inspector, it can work against you, but if you have a sympathetic inspector, it can greatly work for your favor because none of the infrastructure is defined. Um, and, and so as long as I can prove I'm, uh, uh, that I'm I'm unadulterated and sanitary, you know. And and again, I wrote a, yeah everything I want to do is illegal. Uh, I wrote that book several years ago, to, documenting our run-ins with the you know with the food police. But um, but, but you know, but without regards to that, um, uh, again, I, I, the, these things th there there are there are absolutely workarounds, and um, one workaround being simply just start start and and defy them and and force them and and you know don't advertise do it on a qt do it do it like your wedding guest list okay you know do it on the quiet um uh for example i, I know one guy that started his uh pastor poultry business he he was a homeschooler and he hosted the um the state homeschooling convention at his farm served everybody barbecued chicken by the end of the day he had 200 customers um <laughs> and, and, and so so there, there there's a lot there's a lot of ways there's a lot of ways to, you know, to, to get into this, to enter it um, kind of under the radar. And I, I of course, encourage people to do that. Yeah, we, we do too, for pretty much everything. And, and just, it's kind of like you just work your way up, you know, like don't start thinking about, okay, how do I sell this stuff internationally? You know, just th think about doing it in your own small local community yeah. first, just That's get right. up and get going with it. And then, you know, you know, you'll, you'll meet the local inspector at some point, figure out if they're on your side or if they're a dick. And if they're a dick, they'll tell you what to do. And then you go do it. And then you keep moving. And like, that's as simple as it is. It is. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, you, you, you let, let, let inertia work for you. And often, I mean, like in our case, um, you know, back when we started a dec decades ago, uh, it never occurred to me that a bureaucrat would be able to tell tell me I can't grow a chicken and sell it to a voluntary consenting adult who wants to come and get it from me. I mean, it never occurred to me that a bureaucrat would be able to get in, in between that transaction. Uh, unfortunately, that is the case, that a bureaucrat can get between two consenting adults uh, in a voluntary opt-out transaction. And um, and so, so yeah, no, nobody's going to give you a fine. Nobody's going to throw you in jail. What they're going to do is say, you know, you can't do what you're doing, and and then you decide how to how to work around it. You know, uh, I, I mean, like like a, one of my favorites is a couple in Ohio. They started doing this, and the government came in on them. Yeah, you can't, you know, you can't do this. You got to have um, impermeable walls, uh, in, in your processing facility, and uh, so they thought about it, thought about it, said, oh, okay, we'll just we'll just put a hoop house over it. So they just put a hoop house over their over their concrete slab. And uh, they called the inspectors out, said, you know, we got our impermeable walls. Well, the inspectors came out. Oh, they had a hissy fit. This isn't what we meant. You know, we they were thinking, you know, fiberboard and concrete and all this stuff. And so the couple said, walk around outside. They took a garden hose, sprayed it against the plastic, said, are you getting wet over there? And, <laughs> and of course, you know, the, the inspector said, no, we're not. Well, that's an impermeable wall, you know, and, and they had to pass them. So there, there are, there are, there are lots of things. Look, if you can't, if 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 we as entrepreneurs can't be more creative than bureaucrats, you know, uh, heaven help us. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much because I feel like the regulations. I actually sent an email out recently because we've had some people consult with us. We've had three different consultants about cattle and whether you know how to design our land for it and how to you know pro mm -hmm. how the processing works and all of that type of stuff. And we and then I I sent an email to our email list about it and I just basically said, look. I'm just I'm just relaying what other people have told us from and and just showcasing that there's such drastic perspectives and oh man we got replies to that email of people being like no like it is way harder than that like you there's all these regulations you need to do and then I go talk to my brother-in-law who just raises some cows he sends them to the butcher and he sells it to 100 local people and yeah. 
it is what it is. And he's like, dude, it's super easy. So yeah. I'm like, well, which one is it? I got people freaking out on one side and then people tell yeah, me yeah. it's really easy on the other side. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, don't, don't, too, don't do too much with your cattle till I come up and take a look at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're, we don't even have enough water for him yet. So yeah, no, we're, uh, we got a long ways to go on that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, uh, so far it just, it seems like you can make it hard or you can make it easy. And I think making it easy just is from a regulatory standpoint is exactly what you mentioned is just starting small, starting local and, you know, just, just doing that to begin with. And then just, you know, get go over that bridge once you get there for like the higher levels of regulatory standards. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing about doing that, you know, chances are you'll have, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 families as customers. Well, then it becomes a political battle. Then, then when there's, when there's some pushback, you can, you can swamp them with letters. You can swamp them with, you know, with, with emails, you can, you can do all sorts of things. Um, I mean, when, when we've had showdowns, you know, customers show up for us. Um, I remember very well one time uh, we had a, a bureaucrat causing us trouble and he came literally the day after the day after a guy showed up on our doorstep carrying literally had in his arms, his 90 pound, his, his little 90 pound wife. And he said, um, the doctors say that if I don't get toxin, uh, toxin free meat for my wife, she's going to die. Can you help me? And and the, the next day, these these two government agent comes out and says, you know, uh, you're unsanitary. We're going to close you down. And I looked at him and I told him this story about this guy who'd come to our door the day before with his wife. I said, listen, I said, she's going to get she's going to get our clean food. Now, you can either make that a difficult for her or you can you can make it easy for her to get that food. It's all in your hands. You have to make that decision. And that that changed the the tempo the it, it changed the whole tenor of the conversation because suddenly i called him out to act like a human mm -hmm. these, these bureaucrats it's it's like they parked their heart at the office you know just doing my job just doing my job man i mean that's what that's what the nazis said when they pushed the button at auschwitz just doing my job just doing my job don't ever come and tell me just doing my job no did you leave your did you leave your heart at the office somewhere no we're, we're first of all we're, we're we're brother humans okay uh or sister humans we're you know we're we're in this together and uh and and and, and don't just come around here swaggering saying just doing my job uh, let's think about this a little bit. Yeah. Wow. That's a really, that's a really beautiful story. Very powerful. And I, I think that we, uh, yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of that. Just basically telling your story and being human and connecting with people emotionally, yeah. um, mm -hmm. just talking to people like another human being has gone such a long way for us. I, I swear the only thing that we've ever done is we've told our story, we've wrote it down, we verbalized it, and we broadcasted that. And that has attracted everything to us that we've ever dreamed of having, uh, you know, the land and the whole dream of living out here. And yeah. that, that's all it ever took was that was that little bit of human emotional connection that is so lacking right now. Yeah, well, you, you do it, you do it very well. I mean, I've been through, I've been through your, um, this is the the workbook. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've been I've been through the workbook and um yeah, it's uh it's it's truly it's it's quite remarkable. Yeah. Well, well that that's that is a very surreal moment for me is seeing you hold up our book um, because you're such a legend in the space and and you know, yeah, I mean I've I've uh I think I've watched your documentary is wow, probably seven years ago or something now um yeah. and when we first got on you guys but yeah very 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 beautiful that was awesome thank you um okay i got a couple questions that i really uh, want to hit you with i know we're coming up on on time uh, i don't want to take too much of your time here but we have this is this is something that happens to us all the time we have a lot of people that come to us with a lot of ideas and many of their ideas are very much wishful thinking so I was curious if you have any examples of things that you hear people say a lot um, that you think is wishful thinking and maybe not the best approach for people to take when trying to move into this lifestyle of getting on land and growing their own food and, and being a farmer. Mm, uh, boy, probably. 
probably the most common one in wishful thinking is um is coming late in life when your youthful physical physical energy is waning um what what happens is as, as you know a lot of times people don't actually have the whatever the financial wherewithal to to have enough freedom to actually think about a piece of land think about something you know maybe they're maybe they're in their 50s or or something uh a, a, a lot of times people don't come I, I tell you a story uh D david schaefer and i uh did a, a chicken butchering uh demonstration down in tennessee at the homestead festival last year and uh, we had 300 people 300 people all gathered around watching us butcher these chickens and um and dave dave uh, asked the crowd he said uh, i want to ask you a question how many of you and, and the crowd was all you know they were they were uh you know 40 ish you know uh to Late thirties, early fifties. Okay, uh, parents with teenagers and 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 um, some young kids. And he said, "I said I want to see a show of hands. How many of you, when you were sixteen, ever thought that you would want to come early in the morning at seven o'clock to watch chickens be butchered?" <laughs> and and two hands went up. Only two hands. And and what that tells me is that this kind of awareness often comes late in life. You know, you're young, you're invincible. You're, you know, you assume, you assume the grocery store is always going to have food. There's never going to be anything like COVID. Uh, you know, the centers for disease control tells the truth and the, <laughs> <president> <laughs> <is alive. laughs> you, you know, you, you have this, this, I, this, this, you know, kind of fantasy world of, 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 of Disney uh, that, that translates into your, into the way you live. And you're going to, you know, you're going to find the perfect one. You're going to live happily ever after your kids are never going to be sick. You know, it's this Camelot thing, you know, we're, we're, you know, the, the snow is going to fall in the neat little piles. The leaves are going to fall in the neat little piles. The snow is going to fall everywhere, but on the road and, and, you know, all this stuff. And, and then you hit your late thirties, early forties. And guess what? You know, one of the kids needs braces and um and one of them is rebellious and won't do anything you want them to do and and um and the, the and suddenly something like co uh, black swan comes the, the the store shelves are empty and you read what you know you read about red dye 29 and monosodium glutamate oh wow you mean you mean uh, procter and gamble doesn't love me and nestle's doesn't love me and mcdonald's doesn't love me and oh my you know and, and you have this this gradual awakening and 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 so this comes late in life and what happens then is that that you know the cycles of life are real you know you're not 20 forever and and there's a there's a wonderful um uh a kind of cycles of life uh, narrative that you know when when you're 20 you have no experience but you can rebound from your mistakes so that's the time to learn and become a master a master in your vocation because you have enough physical and emotional and mental energy to recuperate from, 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 from falling over. When you get to your late forties and early fifties, you know, you have a little bit of crick in your knee and you don't feel quite as bouncy and you, you start to panic uh, because there's not enough time left and I need this right away. So I need, I need to, I need to get on this and do all this right away. And I want to do all this right away. And so you overextend yourself, you blow, you blow your money on, on, because you don't have experience. So you, you buy an, a tractor that's too expensive, maybe that you don't even need. You build a house that's too expensive that you don't need. You, 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 you and, and you blow, you blow your money, your hard earned money on things that you're not experienced because you're, you're, you're going into a situation that you're not experienced at my, my mentor, Alan nation, I mentioned him before. He said, he said, if you go to a farm sale, if you go to a farm sale and if in, in 10 minutes, you don't know who the sucker is, it's you. <laughs> 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 and, and, and listen, there are plenty of, of, of nice, you know, good people ready to take advantage of an inexperienced person, sell you a cull cow, 
tell you it's it's a great cow, but it's a you know, but they're getting rid of their cull. Uh, sell you, you know, I mean, all uh, uh, the, it's, this is the greatest tractor in the world, and the thing is a lemon. You know, they're just trying to unload it, and, and so what what I see is is this kind of uh, uh, late forties, early fifties kind of panic syndrome that moves us into silly purchases, blowing money on things. I do I do a fair amount of consulting for homesteads, and it's amazing. I get the, the ones I love to do are the ones where they've just bought the property and they don't even live there yet. That's fun. The, the, the bummer is to get on these places. They bought their 50 acres. They've already spent half a million dollars on, on paint and things that rot, rust and depreciate, none of which they need, none of which is a weak link. And now, now they're, they're under financial stress because they've blown half their nest egg on stuff they didn't need that, that neighbors and friends and other people told them, well, you're a farmer. Now you've got to have this and this and this and the other. I mean, I mean, a, a side by side, think about a side by side. You know, those things are 22, $23,000. You know what my side by side is? My side by side is a 1987 Ford Bronco, $1,700 that there were millions of them made cheap to run. I've got a roof and a windshield, knocked all the windows out. The thing's got to pick up. I can take, I can take five people in there comfortably and, and, and run them around. Um, and the thing is $1,700, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff, uh, that, that you, that you learn when you're frugal, you learn alternatives and you learn other ways of doing things. And that takes experience. I, I'm sorry, it's a long answer, but, but I hope it, it ran, it ran you around the rabbit hole far enough to, to know, uh, to, to, to give you an answer to the question. Yeah, no, that, I mean, it makes total sense. And I think people don't understand that going into it. They don't like even, even verbalizing that to someone, a lot of times they still don't get it. And I think like, we tell a lot of stories to, to, to like in our, in our marketing to people to really try to help them drive that fact home that, you know, it, it's, it's wishful thinking. It's, it's excitement, which creates emotional decisions. Uh, worse, worse than that, it's fear, which creates emotional decisions. Um, and then on top of that, it's just the strategy. And it, what I really like is, you know, you've mentioned cash flow uh, a couple of times on the call so far. So it seems like, yeah, like it's not, it's not just you go out and, you know, you, you, you like raise some food to be food self-sufficient and that kind of thing. It's like, if you're going to get into farming, you need to understand the business side of it. You need to build, you need to go out and, and realize the importance of having mentors and consultants like yourself to avoid those a hundred thousand dollar mistakes uh, so yeah. that you can actually have, have success in it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it, it for sure, it's so easy it's so easy in farming to blow fifty or sixty thousand dollars. It's so easy, and and so uh, that's one of the things I loved about your your whole uh, live off the grid dream dream workbook. Um, uh, one of the things I loved about it was that that as you as you set up your strategy for your hospitality business, well, you you can start with a with a platform and a tent, and then you move to this, and you move to this, you move to this, and um, and I mean, I, I think back of, of the way we, you know, we back in the early days, the way we got lumber, we actually went to neighbors that had falling down barns and dad and I tore down barns. You know, the, you know, you look at a barn that's, you know, like the roof's half caved in. There's still a lot of good lumber in that thing, you know, the, the end that still sheds water. So we'd go and we tore down several of those barns in the community. And that's how we got lumber. And we still, you know, those boards are still, you know, in our shed and, and our, our our head shoot and stuff. You know, there are these old boards. Um, then eventually, eventually, you know, we we upgraded. Now we have a sawmill. OK. And so now we don't tear down barns. We 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 can turn our own trees into our own uh, wood that we want to. But 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 you but you start and, and you have to have you have to have a, a, a crawl before you walk mentality. And and that comes from a uh, a thought out strategy, not an emotion of fear. I love what you're saying there. And, and, and a lot of the, a lot of people are coming to this because they're running away. They're running away. They're, they're scared of what they see going on in the city or the economy or the, the dysfunctional social structure of our time. And they're running away, but you can't run away forever. You, at, at some point you have to stop and embrace something better. Well, that embrace of something better has to be 
has to start as an embryo. You don't stop and embrace something better that, that that's a full grown tree. What you what you stop and embrace is an acorn because that's the smallest viable uh, uh, viable prototype of your dream. And, and that's where you start. Nothing is birthed full grown, nothing. It all has to be birthed small. So what happens is people want to birth, they want to birth their dream too big. And when you birth your dream too big, you, you, it, it, it's still born because, because you can't, you can't birth it. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. so, yeah, that's, okay. that's, the, that's the deal. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. We constantly have people coming in here being like, I need $10 million in funding to do what I want to do. And I'm like, no, you don't. Like, let's let's get right back down to minimum viable product and let's see what that actually is. And it turns out you probably only need a couple hundred thousand. So you just reduced your upfront ask by 98%, which yes. is insane. Um, but Absolutely. so uh, speaking of like, you know, we, we have we have some clients that are getting older, um, some really exciting stuff. Actually, we just had a client, um, Trisha and her husband, Bruce, uh, just got um, an investor to secure 40 acres in Arizona to start a permaculture farm. And they are in their 70s uh, and they're super excited for that. Um, and one thing that, that we kind of say is that you can strategize your way around anything. And, and a lot of that comes with help. So, you know, for example, um, whether it be a situation like that where folks are getting older and they they want help physically with stuff or whether it's they want to systemize it so they have more time to spend with their families um, or, you know, maybe they want to open up multiple spots and locations. So you have to have good working systems for people to help you operate the farm. So we've had volunteers, we've had live work exchange, and now we have paid staff. Uh, and do a bit of a combination of that. And I know that in our learnings, we definitely have our preferences on how we do that and how we choose applicants, how we onboard them and how we manage them. Um, but I'd like to hear any stories, tips or advice from your experience on getting help in any of those realms. Yeah, well, we've uh, we've done all those. Uh, we've very, very early on, uh, you know, we just relied on friends to do things, but we were we were basically a little homestead. You know, we were just a self sufficient. We were not a going concern. We were not a business. For so so from 1961 to you know the mid the mid 70s, we were basically a glorified homestead doing a lot of experimenting um, of different things that we've now leveraged into a commercial scale. Um, I came back to the farm full time uh, September 24, 1982, and that's when we actually incorporated polyface and, you know, created the farm name and, and, and created the brand and began, uh, uh, you know, trying to actually make a full-time living uh, farming. And we, we, and we did. Uh, so early on, I used a couple of, we, we used friends. Uh, I had, I had engineer friends that helped me figure out how to put in, you know, automatic, uh, you know, automatic uh, water shutoffs and pumps and things in, in uh water tank. I had a, uh, engineer friend that uh, designed and built uh, my, our first couple of uh, iterations of chicken processing equipment, automatic uh, dunker scalder that would go up and down and that sort of thing. And then, you know, then you have neighbors that you, you know, some that you can work with, some you can't work with, some you can. <laughs> I had a, I had a neighbor that worked in a factory. He had a little farm and, and I was here full time. And so we shared haymaking together. He, I would, I would, uh, Ter Teresa, my wife, uh, we, we would make hay here, fill up about four wagons. And then I'd run over to his place and rake his hay. He'd come home from work and then he'd bail and I'd catch him on a wagon. And in the evening, and, and we'd, we'd unload in the morning before he went to work, he'd come over, help me unload the four wagons that Teresa and I had made the previous day. And, and you know, and, and, and you, you share work together kind of uh, that way. And um, then, you know, then gradually we started having young people wanting to come and learn. So we started the apprenticeship program and that has developed now into a two tier program, the stewardship program, which is a five month program. And then the apprenticeship program, which is a 12 month program and the apprentices come out of the stewards. So we have about 11 stewards normally, and then anywhere from two to four apprentices and the apprentices then of the following year become the first level managers of the stewards of the new stewards that come that year. 
So, uh, and, and now we have staff, there's about uh, 20, 22 of us that earn a full-time living now from the farm. So it's not a, you know, it's not a backyard operation by any means. And, and, and so there's, there's a, there's a whole uh, a group of us. I will tell you that nobody is hourly. Everybody is on either salary or performance based. So for example, uh, we have people running some of these leased farms and, um, and, so what we so so by doing by doing um um motion you know time motion studies we know the value what's the value of putting away a dozen eggs what's the value of gutting a chicken what's the value of moving a herd of cows what's the value of of of, of uh handling a, a group of pigs and so we basically have an opportunity sheet that that folks can choose from as they build their own compensation plan, this performance base. And what that does is it, it makes all of our, um, our, our, our team relationships um, shared risk. We want to only work with people who will share, who will share risk. As you know, hourly, hourly stuff, always you wonder if you're getting what you're paying for, the other person's, you know, thinking you don't appreciate what they're putting in. There's all this tension in, in in hourly. But if you go salary with clear expectations, and if you can do it in half the time, you still get the same pay. You know, so that encourages creativity, and and the performance based encourages, you know, the, the person that's taking care of the of a millennium feather net with a thousand layers in it. If they don't if they don't keep the nest boxes clean, they just doubled up their time cleaning the eggs, and they didn't get paid for it. So, so this incentivizes the meticulous care that, that we're looking for. And finally, all of our team uh, folks know that they have an open door for side hustles. And in other words, if they, if they can conceive of an entrepreneurial add-on that complements what we're doing, they all know that they can do it. So we have, we have, um, you know, one, one lady that does uh, cosmetics. She takes our, our pork lard and stuff and makes, you know, uh, uh, natural uh, chapstick and, you know, hand lotion and stuff. Um, cosmetics. We, you know, we have one that do, does does um, uh, the tours. She actually is full-time employed just doing farm tours. We call them the grass stains tours, but she's a subcontractor. So she's a subcontractor. She sets it everything. She sets them all up, decides when she's going to do, if she needs to, uh, to get help, she hires help. Um, anyway, it, it's, it's completely her, her side hustle. Uh, another guy uh, taps the maple trees and he, he makes maple syrup. He built a little, you know, uh, maple shack, uh, a little sugar shack there and, and makes maple. And of course we sell them through the store. Um, uh, another guy made, uh, got a bloody butcher corn and made cornmeal uh, and sold the flour. Another, another, another one did, did mushrooms. Uh, so you know anything that you can conceive that's complementary, we're, we're glad to add it to the add it to the pot. So you you have you have all those different steps and all those different kinds of things uh, to work together. But yeah, you're right. The the relationships. It, it, um, you know the bottom line of business is marketing and relationships. And if you can keep those um, keep those tender, you're in pretty good shape. Wow. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I mean, it sounds like we have similar philosophies in that, like, it seems that it's like a multi prong approach, you have, you know, your applicants come through, and they go come in for a limited period of time, a shorter period of time, which is five months, and then they can get invited back to a full year. And then those people I'm assuming would probably level up into actually being paid, yes. you know, full time yes. staff. Um, yes. So it's almost like your apprenticing programs are your uh, your training programs for to then actually have like fully trained staff that already know exactly what they're doing. And then you, you, you know, I'm of, I'm in full agreement with like salaries. We don't do any hourly. Everyone's full time because we want their focus and their creativity. And then you're allowing them to actually explore that creativity even more entrepreneurially for them to, you know, have all these add-ons, which I think is really cool. We've had a lot of people pitch us stuff, but uh, you kind of you you, uh, you reframe my thinking with that because 
most of the stuff that people have pitched us that have lived on site with us have nothing to do with what we're doing. <laughs> so I really like that you allow it to happen, but you just make sure that it's like all, everyone's moving generally in the same direction uh, and it, it, it's complementary, and that makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it can't, it can't be competitive and it can't be cross uh, what cross vision cross, you know, um, uh, so yeah, it, it has to, it has to add to what we're, what we're after. Yeah. So we have a, we have a lot of clients that are interested in other types of farming. They're interested in, uh, you know, getting a greenhouse going um, and growing vegetables. They're interested in vertical farming with aquaponics. Um, and, and I was, I was just curious on your thoughts on other types of farming. And do you think that they're more risky uh, and less profitable to begin harder work any anything like that like would you ever go into any of those things yourself yeah well um for some reason we humans become really enamored <laughs> we become really enamored of hubris i guess that's almost a you know a, a redundancy uh and and we we love our technology we love this we we love this stuff but all these systems are very fragile. They're not forgiving. Uh, aeroponics, aquaponics, hydroponics. Of course, I don't believe in hydroponics or aeroponics at all. Uh, I, I think it 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 it, uh, it it when you have soilless systems, it doesn't work. Now, my one caveat on that is, if your substrat, if your substrata is growing uh, worms, then I'm okay with it. And I've seen a couple of of systems that are using pebbles that are so uh, that are so uh, full of organic matter that they have worms in them, uh, you know, kind of a, a flushing type system. But, you know, uh, shoot, I, I keynoted the uh, U.S. Aquaponics Convention, I don't know what, 10 years ago. And the joke there, everybody was saying was, until you've killed 10,000 fish, you know, you're not even a you're not even a grower. And and it spoke to the fragility of this, you know, the, the if the oxygen level changes a bit or the temperature is off a little bit or the nutrients are off a little bit, these are extremely high-tech fragile systems and as you as you head up as you go up that 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 uh that technological ladder the fragility the fragility continues to increase and it's just like it's just like the whole lexicon that we've learned now you know with factory farming from from um you know campylobacter listeria uh food allergies and all this stuff these are all a, a lexicon that has come with the with the technology of factory farming, antibiotics, mRNA injections, and all the other uh, stuff. I mean, when I was a kid, the, the the none of this even existed. We we didn't have MRSA, we didn't have C diff, we didn't have um, you know uh, superbugs, we didn't have food allergies. Uh, you know, you you could have a birthday party for your three year old, and you didn't have to spend two days on the phone with all the other moms asking what you could or could not you know offer as treats for the kids. You everybody just brought what they wanted, and you just ate. And so so it should give us all pause to realize that 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 our our uh our techno fixes when it comes to biology especially when it comes to biology uh our techno fixes have yielded some pretty rough stuff i mean hydrogenated vegetable oil type 2 diabetes rich crackers you know gluten intolerance uh there's all sorts of things that we have done in this technological sphere uh with with, with biology as, as opposed to mechanics you know, uh, wheel bearings and 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 computers and and textile. You know, being able to fabricate metal and bend steel and stainless steel and stuff. You know that uh, th th there's a difference between biology and uh, between living things and non living things. And um, and and I think that as we have as we have have tried to cheat cheat the biology, um, that balance sheet eventually balances out and that balancing out right now is the fact that the united states we invented mcdonald's we invented gmos and we now lead the world in non-infectious chronic morbidity that's not a place to be proud of to be in first place in the world i mean we're talking about we lead we lead ghana we lead uh swali swahizi land okay i mean i mean think about you know whatever you want to some of the some of the, the 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 most you know difficult impoverished places of the planet, 
and the U.S. leads them in in chronic non-infectious morbidity, um, and, and that's because we have we have viewed few we have viewed food and farming from a primarily mechanistic worldview rather than a biological worldview. And I think that I think that the the hydroponics, the the whatever, the vertical farming, the LED lighting, all those things, they also view they also view food as fundamentally a mechanical act and not a biological living thing. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. I'm not a fan of any of that stuff for the same reason. It just seems like you're trying to cheat nature. And if there's one thing that I know, it's that nature always wins. So find a way to work with it um, rather rather than, you know, trying to cheat it and make things, you know, I don't know, yeah. better, faster, whatever you're trying to do. But right. um, so, I mean, there, there's other there's other things that, you know, obviously like like an orchard and using permaculture practices to plant an orchard or, you know, general vegetable and other fruit crops and things, things of that sort. Um, but I get the sense that you're going to get a faster if you're starting out and you want to be self-sufficient and you want to have all of it. I always tell people you can have everything you want. But what you choose first matters, which comes back to the strategic conversation of what you invest your seed capital in at the very beginning. So out of all that stuff, like now we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, like animal agriculture now coming into other types of farming, like orchards, vegetable, fruit, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that your opinion is going to be that it's still going to be the fastest return to start with meat birds and build your way up with the animal systems first and then come back and start focusing more on orchards and vegetables and gardens and things of that sort after. Okay. Um, good question. And, and for me, this is simply an ergonomic thing. Listen, as a small farmer, I do a lot of things by hand. I, I'm not, I'm not mechanized. Uh, you know, we'd have, we have some mechanization, you know, chicken pluckers. Okay. But, but we're, you know, we're, we're, we're gutting chickens by hand. We're doing a lot of hand work. So if I'm going to do hand work, if I'm going to, if whatever I sell, I have to physically pick up and move, then I would rather pick up stuff that's worth $4 and $5 a pound than pick up stuff that's worth 50 cents a pound. It becomes simply an ergonomic thing. Um, so, so the animal proteins, the animal proteins are way more valuable per pound. So if I need to earn $200,000, I'm going to have to move. I'm going to have to physically handle four times as much produce, pounds of produce, to get that two hundred thousand dollars, than to get two hundred thousand dollars worth of chicken or beef or pork or something like that. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, no, yeah, that that makes total sense. I think the other thing in my mind is that like we we are in our property is in a desert alpine climate, so it's it's an interesting piece of property to work with. And what comes with that is fifty one degrees Celsius summers that have droughted our our land and um, our soil is dust. Like it's, it's not soil, it's just dust. So like we need to regenerate our soil to be able to even have what we need to grow fruits and vegetables. And animals are the first step to that, um, to, to being, to in, in, it's like, it's the first step to regenerating and then having the health that you would need to plant orchards and vegetable crops, at least to have them do well. Like you could try, but it's gonna be harder without doing animals first. Yeah, well, I mean, you can certainly you can certainly import compost and things to at least get something started. I'm a I'm a big believer in you know you probably should plant some plant some fruit trees yesterday. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty much I mean just because of the time the time problem, uh, and I'm a big believer in, in feed yourself first, even if it's rudimentary. But uh, but yeah, you're right um, to to grow really high quality um, produce. The beauty of produce is there's no regulation. You know that's the beauty of produce. So you don't have you don't have all the the other uh, costs. And and generally, generally what I think we need are balanced farms with some animals and some produce, and they're balanced and then they work together. The problem is most most people 
don't aren't equally passionate or skilled in both animals and plants. People tend to tend to move toward animals or plants, which is why you want a partner. If you love animals, you need to look for a horticulture partner. If you love horticulture, you need to look for an animal partner. And and that's the way you build, you truly build a balanced, um, you know, a long-term, long-term sustainable system. That's, yeah, that's a really good point. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I really like that. I've definitely gotten some good ideas from our conversation, even, even, so, even like we own our land. So, you know, we, we could even invite somebody in as a contractor who could start their farming business on our property. Um, and then help us regenerate the soil because it's more than we can manage at this point, yes. um, yeah. which is which is a cool, interesting thought. Um, all right. Well, yeah, I don't want to take any I don't take too much of your time. Um, do you uh, do you have time for a, one or two more questions? Uh, I'm actually bumping up against. A, uh, yeah, I need to I need to. You got to head out. Uh, yeah. I, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm a hard thing here. Uh, we actually Teresa and I need to go to we need to go uh, to a to the funeral home this evening a, a family friend uh, passed away and the visitation is tonight so we're trying to get over there uh, before it gets too late uh, to get there so good well thank you so much uh, I really appreciate this I think this is gonna be really really valuable for a lot of people um, you're you're super awesome to chat with you're open you're honest you're is you're just you're fun you got a great great sense of humor so thank you I'm really excited to come down and tour your guys's place and we're gonna try and get you up here to our place to give us a hand with our designs and whatnot and maybe some of the folks listening to this will actually be able to attend that and and see you in person. Um, so thank you so much and have a good rest of your night. We'll stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a delight. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Have a good rest of your day. You too.